What are you waiting for? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. The newest graduates of the paratroopers school were about to take their first real jump out of an airplane. One of the young men, remembering what he had learned in class, mentioned that it only takes seven seconds for a free fall jump of a thousand feet. One of the less confident members of the group turned to his partner, trembling, asking, supposing your chute doesn't open, what would you do? His friend answered, well, all I know is I'd have seven seconds to learn how to fly. <laughs> Welcome to the third Sunday of Lent and our third lesson of Lent. During weeks one and two, our headline themes were human attributes to nurture in ourselves. First, humility, and then last week, reverence. By way of review, with humility, which involves recognizing who we are in the face of an almighty God, we are to approach God in reverence and holy awe. Today, we shift the perspective just a bit and consider a quality assigned to God that is offered to us, namely, patience. And with the gospel as our guiding text, we will discover that when it comes to God, the word has a slightly different nuance than you might expect. And it calls forth a particular response. Our reading this morning comes from Luke 13, part of Jesus' ten-chapter sojourn from Galilee to Jerusalem, in which we read of miracles, parables, and teachings of all sorts. The setting is a very public one. Jesus is addressing crowds that have gathered around him, and he has already talked about a range of topics, anxiety, watchfulness, signs of the end of the age. Now, as chapter 13 begins, some members of the crowd interject with a piece of breaking news. Some Galileans have been slaughtered by Pilate while making sacrifices in the temple. The town criers clearly want Jesus to make some type of commentary about the horrible event. Jesus perceives what the crowd is getting at that these Galileans must have done something to deserve their fate. After all, the prevailing mindset of the time was that illness and tragedies befall those who God wants to punish in some way for their disobedience. Jesus addresses the crowd, but not in a way that people expect. Not only... Does he reject the notion that the Galileans somehow deserved punishment? But Jesus goes on to raise the ante. He cites yet another example of tragedy and suffering. He brings up the 18 people killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Once again, Jesus dismisses the idea that the victims were somehow worse offenders than the next folk. Rather, he underscores the same conclusion he draws from the incident with Pilate. He simply tells the crowds to repent or perish. Change your course, or when your time comes and you die, you will perish. And that's tragic, too. With that... Jesus tells this curious little parable about a man with a fig tree in his garden. 
The landowner isn't really looking for much. All he wants is figs from his fig tree. That's it. But the fig tree isn't producing any. It's there. It's alive. No doubt the wood is green and there's some leaves on the trees, but no figs. The owner of the tree says it's best yanked out of the garden. All it's doing is taking up space which could be used more productively. But the gardener pleads with the landowner to give the tree a little longer. Just one more year. Give it some mulch. Turn the soil over. Give it some TLC. And then, if it's still unproductive, the tree can be cut down. Now, I'll take a guess at your thoughts. Why on earth are these two vignettes put together? I mean, it seems kind of like a non sequitur, a case where one story doesn't logically follow the other. Well, let's take another look. For when viewed from the perspective of who we are and our purpose in life, you know what? The stories do have a connection. And what's more, they help us understand what patience means as it relates to God. 